In the beginning of this story, Lord Aiden Lyanster and Lady Ellen de Hard are getting married, making it a wonderful occasion for a duke and marquis. The marriage is expected to benefit both families and the bride and groom look adorable together. However, the narrator reveals that they are actually the novel's antagonist, Ellen Gehard. As we know, villains in stories often face a tragic end. The main characters of the novel are Adam Lanster and Yulia Sherritt, who meet and fall deeply in love. This love story causes tension as it involves Ellen Gehard, who is betrothed to Aiden. After their marriage at a young age, Ellen constantly torments Aiden, and her torment extends to his lover, Yulia. In fact, Ellen even schemes to have Yulia killed. However, as fate would have it, Ellen's plan to murder Yulia leads to her own downfall. In the end, Aiden and Yulia's love grows stronger than ever, just like in any other novel. Unfortunately, the narrator, who is Ellen, got into an accident and somehow ended up in this situation. As Ellen thinks ahead, she realizes that a 10-year-old girl like her can only do so much to stop an arranged marriage. Now they are forcing two children who don't know each other into the same room, at least they get separate beds. Before the big day, she is given a lecture on married life by Nanny Mona. Nanny Mona says, you may not need to know this right away, but it will certainly make your life with the Duke easier. Ellen thinks that the Duke Aiden has heard all before. She wonders what a 10-year-old is supposed to do with this information, especially when it's all wrong. She decides that she might as well try to get along with him for the next 10 years as her life depends on it. Ellen ponders what kind of smile would make a good first impression. Feeling nervous, Ellen tells Aiden, you're really handsome. She realizes that they're already off to a bad start. Despite hearing this, Aid becomes flustered. Ellen suggests to Aiden, Why don't we talk and get to know each other since we never got a chance to properly meet beforehand? However, Aiden ignores her and goes to his bed while saying, Don't touch me. Ellen thinks to herself that Aiden really hates her. She decides not to touch him anyway and goes to her bed, pondering what could be wrong with him. Halfway through the night, Ellen wakes up and thinks about how a 29-year-old person can sleep after being forced into a marriage as a 10-year-old. She also feels that time moves slowly in this situation and she is already tired of it. As she looks at Aiden's handsome face, she considers taking a good look at him. Although their marriage is one of convenience and they will likely hate each other by the time they are 20, Ellen thinks about how the boy will grow up. He will inherit the prestigious Lionster Duchy and become the Dark Shroud who holds power over the entire empire. He will eventually become Aiden Lionster. Ellen reflects that the original Ellen fell for Aiden at first glance, but it wasn't love. It was obsession. The previous Ellen intruded on Aiden's sword training, injured him, took her anger out on those around him, and even manipulated him using the church and his own parents. When Aiden finally couldn't take it anymore and demanded a divorce at the age of 29, she refused that too. Thinking about Aiden's past, Ellen realizes that it's no wonder he wanted to leave her after 10 years of marriage. As she lies in bed, Ellen ponders that at least now she understands why the original Ellen was so obsessed and determined in the first place. She hopes that by staying on good terms with Aiden, she might get to see him more regularly. However, she also worries about not falling in love with him. As she watches Aiden restlessly toss and turn in his sleep, Ellen calls out to him Lord Aiden. She approaches his bedside and asks, Are you all right? Wondering if he is having a nightmare, Ellen places her hand on his head to check if he has a fever. However, Aiden opens his eyes and looks at her with a stern expression. Ellen asks Aiden if he is all right, to which Aiden pushes her hand away, saying, Don't touch me. Ellen then inquires if he is sick, but Aiden, now agitated, insists that she stays away from him. Ellen agrees not to touch him but mentions that they need a doctor. Aiden panics and begs her not to call for a doctor, claiming he will just go back to sleep and be fine. Ellen thinks to herself that Aiden's reaction seems more than just simple hatred. Adrian from the novel also detested Ellen clinging to him too, which was due to her extreme behavior. Observing Aiden's reaction when they just met indicates that something happened to him long before. If they are to get along for the next 10 years, she must look after him. Or maybe if she simply wants to look after him. Aiden looks at Ellen in a strange manner. She asks him if he is feeling better and if he is alright. Aiden stands near the door and tells her to go back to her bed and sleep. Afterward, he leaves the room. In the next scene, we see Ellen taking a bath and Nanny Mona entering. She assists Ellen with her bath and getting dressed. Afterward, Ellen thinks to herself that now that she is Lady Ellen Lyonster, she must stay alive by not obsessing over Aiden. She decides to start saving money, immediately divorce Aiden once Yulia shows up, and live out the rest of her life abroad. Mona then brings up the topic of the luncheon with the Duke and Duchess. Ellen recalls that they had left early that morning to attend to territory matters. She is surprised to hear this and Mona explains that something urgent must have come up, causing them to be gone for a whole fortnight. Ellen thinks to herself that this is lucky for her, 
as she won't have to worry about the Duke and Duchess' contentious relationship or their indifference towards their son, just yet. With a fortnight to spare, Ellen plans to use that time to find out what happened to Aiden. Sitting down to enjoy some delicious, delicious food, Ellen praises the cream, saying, Oh, this cream is so light. The maid then asks if they can use such fine china, and Ellen smiles, replying, Of course. I hope we can get along from now on. The maid expresses her gratitude, saying no one has ever been so kind to think of them before. Ellen admits that she hasn't properly met Aiden despite being married now. She feels lonely as she barely knows her own husband. The maids admit that they don't know much about Aiden either, as he is not the type of person to talk to them. He is described as finicky and awfully quiet. Ellen wonders who knows Aiden well and the maids suggest that he often trains with the knights so they might know something about him. They also mention that Nanny Whitney, Aiden's nanny since he was a baby, might know him better than anyone. Surprised, Ellen learns that Nanny Whitney has managed everything for Lord Aiden, who has many duties and lessons to attend. Realizing that wealthy children are often raised by their nannies, including herself and Nanny Mona, Ellen thinks that maybe she should speak with the nanny instead. During this time, Aiden appears disheartened on the practice ground when he hears a voice from behind asking, How does it feel to be married, Lord Aiden? Aiden turns to find Sir Philip and engages in a conversation. Philip responds positively, expressing his contentment with being married to his first sweetheart and enjoying the companionship. Aiden, however, reveals his fear and declares that it's impossible for him to experience such feelings. Meanwhile, Ellen reflects on her inability to see Aiden for three days, expressing frustration at his elusive presence during mealtimes and her failed attempts to locate him. Despite her initial enthusiasm, Ellen acknowledges the undesirable parallels between her situation and how the character Ellen stalked Aiden in the book. She contemplates this with a mix of concern and determination, expressing that it's not the outcome she desires. In this scene, Ellen, upon seeing Aiden, decides to focus on catching him later. She reflects on the advantage of her maid network, expressing eagerness to inform when they locate Aiden. Despite her efforts, when she calls out to Lord Aiden, he ignores her, prompting Ellen to wonder if her actions are excessive given she hasn't done anything yet. Aiden, visibly angered, instructs her to refrain from touching him, evoking Ellen's question about whether he hates her so much. Aiden responds with stern avoidance. Ellen, in a more subdued tone, suggests the option of ignoring him and reflects on the possibility of disgusting him without knowing the reasons behind his intense reaction. During this moment, Nanny arrives, addressing Lord Aiden with concern. Ellen, observing them, thinks to herself that this must be Nanny Whitney. Whitney, holding Aiden's hand, asks if he's all right and suggests taking him to his room. Ellen, realizing the connection, thinks, it's this. Whitney persists, asking Aiden if they should go to his room. Ellen, deep in thought, suspects that this woman must be the culprit. Recalling details from the novel, she believes that Aiden's contempt for women, excluding Yulia, was rooted in Nanny Whitney's influence. Ellen speculates that Whitney, exploiting her authority as his nanny, controlled him and made him obedient. The trauma of this mental abuse and misuse of power likely prevented Aiden from seeking help, exacerbated unknowingly by Ellen's actions. Reflecting on the situation, Ellen expresses disbelief that the original novel omitted this critical issue. When Whitney insists on handling the matter, Ellen firmly instructs her to let Aiden go. Ignoring Whitney's objections, Ellen covers Aiden with her shawl, surprising Whitney. Despite Whitney's attempt to assert traditional roles, Ellen asserts her status as Lady Lionster, emphasizing that she is now part of the House Lionster. Whitney, acknowledging the authority, apologizes. Ellen then addresses Aiden, expressing her intention to talk to him privately. In the unfolding story, the noble house of Lionster is prominently featured as a name known and revered by all. It holds unparalleled power in the empire, both in reputation and reality. Born into this house, individuals are tasked with safeguarding and elevating its prestige from birth, ensuring that the Lionster name continues to symbolize honor, pride, and wealth. The protagonist expresses weariness with this responsibility, reflecting on Whitney's assertion that they lack the necessary patience and tenacity for their station. Despite being advised to heed Whitney's counsel, there is a growing desire to break free from living at the mercy of others. The narrative suggests an internal conflict as the protagonist contemplates making a name for themselves based on their merits rather than relying solely on the Lionster name. There's an aspiration to escape the confines of House Lionster once fully grown, questioning the expectations placed upon them. Following this, Whitney addresses Lord Aiden, emphasizing that his responsibilities to the family will intensify after his marriage the next day. She cautions him against any behavior that could tarnish the family name, stressing that a marriage is meant to unite two houses and that House Gehard might exploit the union for control and profit. Whitney singles out Lady Ellen Gehard as a central figure in this plan. She warns Aiden about potential manipulations from Ellen due to his tendency for distractions and undignified behavior. 
Aiden's surprise questions Ellen's age, to which Whitney underscores the importance of safeguarding his reputation in front of his parents. She reiterates the perceived danger of women going after what belongs to a man, emphasizing the need for constant vigilance to maintain the respectable image of a Lionster. Contemplating Nanny Whitney's words, Aiden acknowledges that her words may sound like nonsense, but he also senses a truth in them. Whitney warns him about the potential consequences of allowing servants to disrespect him, emphasizing that Lady Ellen could take advantage and harm him. Stressing his parents' high expectations, Whitney urges Aiden not to disappoint them. Aiden, realizing the potential consequences, decides not to ignore her words to avoid them coming true. Whitney, holding Aiden's hand, considers today's lesson crucial. Aiden questions whether his fear is because Nanny is also a woman. Whitney advises him not to trust women, emphasizing his inability to judge character properly at his age. She stresses the importance of her guidance for his well-being, urging him to remember her words and not to forget the lesson she imparted. Returning to his room and lying on the bed, Aiden reflects on the warning that allowing Lady Ellen Jahar to control him would be detrimental. Despite his efforts to avoid her, he recalls saying, let him go. Meanwhile, Ellen stands on the balcony, contemplating the situation. She acknowledges Yulia as Aiden's soulmate and believes that it must have been liberating for him to meet her after enduring suffering. However, she finds it cruel to leave a ten-year-old to suffer until that point. Determined to protect the children, she decides to assist Aiden in overcoming his trauma until their eventual divorce. Ellen is willing to alter the story to ensure Aiden's well-being, believing that by taking care of him, she can improve his chances with Yulia and increase her own chances of survival. The next morning, Aiden is practicing when Ellen approaches, calling out to him and greeting him with a smile. As she engages with the soldiers, Philip inquires about her presence, and Ellen explains that she wanted to say hello since they'll be seeing each other more often. Philip remarks on Aiden's aloof demeanor, and Ellen jokingly admits she lets it go because he's handsome, prompting laughter from the soldiers. However, Whitney intervenes, reminding Aiden about completing schoolwork. Ellen protests, suggesting it can wait, but Whitney insists he must do it immediately. As Whitney holds Aiden's hand, Ellen confronts her, questioning if he can't do it later. Whitney firmly asserts he must do it now. Ellen, determined, approaches Aiden and tells Whitney to let him go. Despite Whitney's objections, Ellen pushes her away from Aiden. Ellen asserts to Whitney that she and Aiden are in the middle of a conversation and promises to bring him for the schoolwork later. Whitney warns Ellen about her behavior and threatens to report it to Aiden's father. Unfazed, Ellen emphasizes her position as the future lady of the house and challenges Whitney's authority. The soldiers watch the confrontation. Ellen grabs Aiden's shirt and insists they leave. Aiden questions her choice of route, and Ellen admits she knows but wants to get closer to him. Concerned about potential consequences, Aiden wonders why she talked back to Whitney, considering his parents' trust in her. Ellen reveals her intention to grow closer to him, leaving Aiden shocked. Ellen expresses the idea that married couples are like a team, at least until they divorce. Despite being a team, she and Aiden have never had a proper conversation. She likens being married at their age to being friends and enthusiastically declares that they are on each other's sides. Aiden, somewhat skeptical, asks if that's all. Ellen, pondering, realizes they can start with activities friends do, like eating and playing together. Aiden suggests eating and playing together, prompting him to wonder what people do when they're on the same side. Ellen explains they badmouth others together, come for each other, and laugh together. Aiden, somewhat surprised, questions if she would really do those things with him, and Ellen confidently responds with a, of course, as she finds him cute. Aiden admits he's never had friends and contemplates that being married doesn't sound scary. Ellen, looking into Aiden's eyes, sees this positively and asks if he's excited. Aiden stumbles, saying he's in and wants them on the same side. He then realizes he said it out loud. Later that night, Ellen sits in her room as Mona does her hair. Ellen reflects on Aiden's initial fear of her but notes how he brightened up at the idea of them being friends. She is determined to be the best friend Aiden has ever had until they sign the divorce papers. To achieve that, she must separate him from Manny Whitney. Mona asks if Ellen needs something, and she responds with a smile, saying yes. In his room, Aiden contemplates the idea of friendship, realizing it involves being part of one team akin to the concept of marriage. Reflecting on Ellen, he finds the idea rather nice. The next morning, Ellen joyfully greets Aiden, surprised when he responds with a greeting. Excited, she suggests joining him at the training grounds, and Aiden, initially surprised, agrees as they had agreed to be friends. As Aiden walks ahead, Ellen thinks about working on her stamina, noting that he hardly breaks a sweat walking up the hill and considering the potential need for stamina in the future. During this time, Maid Wendy loses control of the cart, causing her to fall towards Aiden and Ellen who are standing nearby. Wendy falls onto Aiden and the cart tips to the side. 
Apologizing profusely, she expresses her sincere apologies to Aiden. In response, Aiden coldly commands her to move. However, Ellen intervenes, reassuring Wendy and encouraging her to get out. Wendy, surprised that Ellen knows her name, expresses gratitude before leaving the scene. Ellen approaches Aiden and offers her hand. Reflecting, she acknowledges that resolving things with a simple gesture of friendship isn't as easy as she hoped. Aiden, in his thoughts, expresses frustration about letting something small bother him. Nevertheless, Ellen sits beside Aiden and reassures him, reminding him of her commitment as his wife to support him. She encourages him to express his feelings and acknowledges that it's okay to feel upset in the present moment. Aiden stands, suggesting they continue, but Ellen recalls something she needs to do, apologizing for leaving after asking to join him. Aiden hesitates but agrees. As Aiden proceeds with his training, Ellen reflects on the need to resolve the incident with Wendy before Nanny Whitney discovers it, feeling a bit guilty for sending Aiden away. Ellen approaches Wendy, expressing concern about the incident with the cart and emphasizes the need for caution. She warns Wendy about the potential consequences, mentioning the severity of the situation and the importance of being more careful in the future. Wendy apologizes, seeking forgiveness, and Ellen highlights the gravity of the situation, reminding Wendy of the strict expectations within the household. Wendy pleads for mercy from Ellen. Ellen comforts Wendy by saying not to worry as long as she is cautious and no one else needs to know. Wendy is grateful and thanks Ellen. Ellen thinks that a warm touch can provide more comfort than words, but she also believes she can't help Aiden in the same way, as it might cause him distress. Her main concern is ensuring Aiden feels safe. During this time, Philip was teaching Aiden how to use a sword. Aiden thought about Ellen and wondered why she hadn't visited him in a few days as he expected her to come see him every day. Philip noticed Aiden staring at the door and asked about his concern. Aiden inquired if it was normal for someone to be friends with their wife. Philip affirmed that it was as his wife was not only his sweetheart but also his best friend and they practically grew up together. Curious, Aiden asked what friends do together. Philip reminisces about the activities they used to do together at Aiden's age, like playing in the fields and horseback riding. Aiden ponders the notion of doing things together and then departs. Meanwhile, Ellen reflects on the four days since the cart incident, expressing hesitation to see Aiden as she fears her efforts might have worsened his mental wounds. Aiden approaches Ellen, greeting her and expressing that he hasn't seen her in a while. Ellen is pleasantly surprised by Aiden greeting her first and admits that she missed him. Aiden informed Ellen that he was heading to training practice and invited her to join him. They were practicing horseback riding on the hills behind their estate. Aiden described the path as bumpy but flat, making it relatively easy to reach the training spot. Ellen smiled and asked if she could join him. Aiden was surprised and thought about how he had been worried about her avoiding him, but it seemed she missed him as well. Ellen found Aiden's cuteness endearing but reminded herself not to like him too much. Aiden, sensing her thoughts, tried to stop himself from thinking that way, emphasizing that their relationship should remain within the bounds of friendship. Both Aiden and Ellen arrive at the horseback riding practice area. Philip guides Ellen while Aiden thanks him for arranging the seating. Philip questions Aiden about his eagerness to practice as he already seems to be a skilled rider. Aiden explains that he needs regular practice to avoid getting rusty. Aiden then mounts a large horse, which impresses Ellen. She reflects on how skilled and impressive Aiden is in the novel, being an exceptional fighter and destined to become the Dark Shroud, who controls the entire empire. Ellen is astonished and excitedly compliments Aiden's horseback riding skills, finding his good looks even more appealing. She questions how Aiden became so skilled, and he offers her a ride. Ellen is surprised but agrees as Aiden assures her that the easy field should be manageable for her. Ellen hopes to ride like the heroines she reads about in books and starts her journey. Aiden then inquires if she means riding with him. Ellen contemplates riding on her own but decides against it, fearing she might cause Aiden further distress. She calls for Philip's help and he nervously asks if she means on his course. Ellen instructs him to hold on tight as she mounts Philip's course. Once seated, Philip assists her further and he also sits down on the horse. Aiden watches this unfold, feeling uneasy and unsure about the situation. Ellen enjoys her horse ride, expressing how amazing and fun it is, although she admits it's a bit terrifying due to her small stature. Aiden notices his ability to comfortably interact physically with others, as he extended his hand to Ellen without hesitation earlier. Aiden approaches Ellen on the horse and calls her name. She reacts with surprise and Aiden offers her his hand to help her maintain balance. However, Ellen loses her balance, causing her to panic. Philip tries to reassure her and Ellen insists she has a great sense of balance. Aiden, observing the situation, reassures himself that he's fine. After the horse ride, Philip points out that he hasn't seen Nanny Whitney, who usually demands an explanation whenever there's a change in training schedules. Aiden ponders Ellen's relationship with everyone at the house. 
as she made an effort to avoid him earlier but doesn't seem to mind others. He questions if they were truly friends. Inside the mansion, the maids call for Nanny Whitney. Apologizing for the disturbance, they express their trust in her help. Mona, one of the maids, mentions that Ellen has assigned her many tasks, and each household has its own way of doing things, so she's still learning. She humbly asks for Nanny Whitney's assistance, admitting she's a slow learner. Whitney, however, questions Mona's attitude and Mona requests a meeting with Lady Ellen. In her room, Ellen reflects on Aiden's capabilities, realizing that despite being the leading man, she mistakenly perceived him as weak due to Nanny Whitney's influence. She acknowledges Aiden's entrepreneurial skills, having secretly started a business at the age of 11 and accumulating enough wealth to be financially stable. Contemplating a strategic approach, Ellen thinks about earning Aiden's trust to ensure her inclusion in future endeavors. She sees an opportunity to benefit financially from their divorce if she helps him. Just as she contemplates this idea, there's a knock on the door and Whitney enters. Ellen informs Whitney that she is no longer required as Aiden's nanny, eliciting a visibly angered reaction from Whitney. Whitney sternly asserts her authority, reminding Lady Ellen that being the future Duchess doesn't grant her the right to dismiss her. Ellen, undeterred, challenges Whitney's control of the household, expressing her intention to inform the Duke and Duchess about the negative consequences of keeping a servant who desires to manipulate her masters. Whitney defends her actions, emphasizing her duty as Lord Iden's nanny, claiming to be his sole advisor since birth and stressing her extensive responsibilities. Ellen, unconvinced, criticizes Whitney, considering her more of an oppressor than an advisor, accusing her of attempting to mold the boy as she pleases before he can develop his own sense of self-worth. Whitney vehemently denies crossing any lines, dismissing Lady Ellen's concerns, and questioning the authority of someone who has been at the estate for only a month. Unfazed, Ellen challenges Whitney's role as Aiden's advisor, capitalizing on the absence of other authority figures at the moment. Meanwhile, Aiden contemplates his complex feelings, grappling with discomfort when touched by others, but finding solace in Ellen's caring gestures. He questions his desires and wonders if he can reciprocate the desire to touch Ellen. In the garden, Ellen joins Aiden and appreciates the beautiful day, acknowledging the positive change in Aiden after separating him from Manny Whitney's influence, albeit temporarily. Ellen's gaze falls upon Aiden, peacefully sleeping beneath a tree. Reflecting on the past, she recalls their initial interactions when he was afraid of her. Now, witnessing his transformation, she finds joy in his improved demeanor and the genuine smiles he shares. Ellen feels a sense of accomplishment as her efforts to bridge the gap between them bear fruit. As she observes Aiden's serene face, she can't help but admire his beauty, understanding why people are captivated by him. Meanwhile, Aiden, sensing Ellen's prolonged gaze, humorously interprets it as her appreciation for his looks. Ellen's admiration for Aiden's handsome appearance becomes a delightful moment in their evolving relationship. Aiden contemplates Ellen's stolen glances and decides to stay still, hoping she will come closer. When Ellen eventually touches him, he finds comfort and tries to convince himself that he's not scared when Ellen touches him. However, as he opens his eyes, he is shocked to see Ellen in front of him. In a moment of impulse, Aiden kisses her. Ellen is surprised and Aiden wonders if she didn't like it. Ellen quickly attributes it to an accident, reassuring Aiden. As Aiden reflects, he realizes that Ellen was worried about him all along, understanding the depth of her concern for him. Aiden reflects on the concerns people have had for him throughout his life, focusing on his skills, studies, and family legacy. However, he notes that no one has ever cared enough about his emotional well-being until an accidental kiss occurs. Ellen's immediate inquiry about his well-being makes him realize that she genuinely worries about his feelings, marking a significant shift from the usual concerns he experiences. This realization deepens Aiden's understanding of Ellen's concern for him. Ellen, in response to the accidental kiss, explains to Aiden that close friends often share kisses, hold hands, and hug. Aiden, surprised, seeks clarification and Ellen enthusiastically assures him that such gestures are entirely normal among friends. As Ellen contemplates that kissing might not be commonplace but isn't entirely inappropriate, Aiden, perhaps encouraged by her openness, suggests trying something. In a somewhat shy manner, Aiden proposes holding hands, leaving Ellen to wonder if Aiden is genuinely suggesting this gesture or if there's a deeper implication. Ellen, expressing concern, asks Aiden if he'll be all right. Aiden, desiring a more friendly connection, takes Ellen's hand, acknowledging that holding hands is a pleasant experience. In the midst of the moment, Aiden admits he is glad that Ellen is his wife. This unexpected revelation surprises everyone witnessing Aiden and Ellen together. While Ellen wonders about the possibility of Aiden feeling uncomfortable due to their sweaty palms, she appreciates that, at least, he is no longer afraid. Ellen reflects on the effectiveness of expressing her feelings in a moment of panic, realizing that it has brought a positive change in their dynamic. Aiden Inquisitive asks Ellen about the appropriate time for friends to hug. 
Ellen, intrigued by Aiden's newfound openness, contemplates the situation. Aiden, eager to explore the dynamics of friendship, seeks to understand when friends typically hug. Ellen, recognizing this as an opportunity for Aiden to acclimate to physical affection from someone he trusts, envisions it as a step toward enabling him to engage in similar interactions with others in the future. Ellen, taking the initiative, hugs Aiden and explains that hugging is an expression of support, often used for congratulating, comforting, or showing support. Aiden, appreciative, expresses his desire to share something with Ellen. He takes her hand and leads her to a display of businesses under the Lionster name, surprising Ellen. Aiden proudly reveals his responsibility for these businesses and invites Ellen to take a closer look, leaving her pleasantly taken aback. Ellen deliberates on whether she should accept Aiden's invitation to examine the businesses, grappling with doubts about his intentions. Aiden, sensing her hesitation, offers to provide explanations if she becomes confused. As Ellen scrutinizes the handwritten notes, she is taken aback by the juvenile script, raising questions about Aiden's involvement. Her shock intensifies as she discovers a surprising element. Aiden candidly admits that the businesses currently lack profitability. As Ellen examines the documents, she realizes that every piece is filled with Aiden's handwriting. Connecting the dots, she surmises that Aiden is strategizing to enhance the profitability of existing Lionster businesses and, in turn, finances independent venture. The novel's reference to his secret business endeavors at the age of 11 suggests that he has already initiated this ambitious journey. Despite his progress, the challenge lies in finding a way to legitimize the funds. Prompted by empathy and support, Ellen offers to assist Aiden in his business venture, a gesture that brings comfort to him in the face of this intricate undertaking. Ellen, realizing Aiden's skepticism about her ability to help, acknowledges his intention to embark on his business venture independently. Despite this, she proposes a trip for both of them, prompting Aiden to instruct the servants to prepare a coach without inquiring about the destination. Ellen, puzzled by Aiden's lack of curiosity, reflects on his recent openness about his business plans. Aiden, demonstrating trust and friendship, asserts that they are in it together. Acknowledging his trust, Ellen feels a strong sense of loyalty to Aiden, but also concerns about his unwavering trust in others. She recognizes the need for caution and whispers to herself about Aiden's blind trust. The two of them arrive at the bank and Ellen informs the bank manager that she's there to inquire about her account under the name Ellen Gehard. The bank manager guides her to review the account details, offering assistance. Ellen examines the records and reflects on the substantial assets she gained through marriage despite not being the favorite Gehard family member. After looking at the records, Ellen places a paper on the table and hands it to Aiden, stating that it contains her personal funds. She emphasizes the confidentiality of these funds, ensuring that Aiden won't need to resort to risky methods to generate money, as the transactions will remain untraceable. Aiden expresses surprise, asking Ellen if she is sure he can have all the money. Ellen reassures him, considering it her investment in his business venture. Aiden, so surprised, questions whether Ellen truly believes he will be successful. Ellen responds with a smile, emphasizing her support for him. Aiden, determined, thinks about multiplying and returning Ellen's investment. The next day, Ellen suggests a fun outing, and a person observing them comments on their apparent friendship. Ellen encourages Aiden to eat a treat, and when he finds her odd, she is left surprised and asks why. Aiden expresses his feelings, noting that despite being the same age, Ellen treats him as if he's younger. Ellen, holding his hand, clarifies that she sees him as a friend. Ellen, reflecting on Aiden's fluctuating moods for a 10-year-old, hears Aiden say they can't let go of hands due to the crowd. While thinking about the crowd, Ellen's hand slips away and she frantically searches for Aiden. Panicking, she calls out for him until she finds him behind a wall. Aiden, upon seeing Ellen, hugs her. Ellen expresses concern about Aiden's discomfort with physical contact, acknowledging his struggle to overcome trauma. Aiden reassures her that he's fine with her touching him, but not with others. Sympathizing with this situation, Ellen reflects on the challenges of overcoming trauma and emphasizes the importance of taking small, careful steps. She requests Aiden to consider making physical contact with others, gradually overcoming his fears over time. Ellen's approach reflects a compassionate understanding of Aiden's feelings and the need for patience in the healing process. Aiden assures Ellen of his presence, seeking validation for his efforts in overcoming trauma. Ellen, reflecting on Aiden's unexpected response, laughs. She then suggests that Aiden attempt to make physical contact with others as he does with her, proposing simple gestures like a shoulder graze or a quick hand squeeze. Aiden agrees, acknowledging that it may take time to get used to but expressing his commitment to trying. However, he adds a condition. Whenever he handles it well, he wants Ellen to do something for him, showcasing his growing trust in their friendship. Aiden, seeking validation, asks Ellen to acknowledge his efforts. Ellen praises him, saying, Great job, Aiden. 
Adnan shares an instance where he picked up a hairpin for Wendy, finding it a bit challenging. Despite the difficulty, he admits that it felt nice, prompting him to question Ellen about the potential for receiving more praise if he does well multiple times in a day. Ellen, bemused, wonders how many times he plans to try expressing her hope that he does indeed make the effort. A few days later, two maids converse about Ellen and Aiden frequently leaving the estate. One maid observes that Lady Ellen even waited for Lord Aiden to finish his studies, noting the joy on his face when he saw her. The maids find the situation adorable. Suddenly, Nanny Whitney appears, causing the maids to become flustered, quickly excusing themselves with the excuse of being busy. On the other side, Ellen enthusiastically tests the food, declaring it the best declare she's ever had. The cook expresses gratitude for her compliment. Meanwhile, Aiden contemplates how Ellen has quickly developed good relations with someone she just met. Aiden acknowledges her incredible social skills. Ellen, still enjoying the food, invites Aiden to appreciate the delicious offerings, expressing confidence in the shop's future success due to its fresh and delightful offerings, despite its somewhat secluded location. Aiden appreciates the quality but remains unsure about what would attract people to the place. Ellen contemplates the potential success of the patisserie, envisioning it becoming a major franchise and expanding into foreign markets. She considers the idea of Aiden or another third party supporting the business in the novel, leading to significant returns in the future. However, she acknowledges that convincing Aiden at this moment might be challenging. Ellen decides to let him carefully consider the opportunity. She then offers Aiden a muffin, noting that it's not overly sweet and aligns with his taste preferences. Aiden, after trying it, agrees that it smells amazing and Ellen is pleased that it suits his liking. Aiden contemplates investing in the patisserie, considering the benefits of discreet investments in smaller businesses due to less competition from other nobles. Ellen observes his changing thoughts, questioning whether he already had plans to invest. She finds it surprising and wonders which aspect is more shocking. Aiden realizes the advantages of investing in businesses like the patisserie and notes that other nobles prefer mining or trade, leaving less competition in this sector. Ellen admires Aiden's thoughtful approach and is delighted that they share a similar perspective. Ellen agrees with Aiden's insight into the potential success of the patisserie, emphasizing how even a small cake can lead to significant trade opportunities. She reflects on the idea that small things can change people's lives. Aiden, eager to start, asks where they should begin. Later in her room, Mona observes Ellen's happiness and teases her about falling in love with Lord Aiden, noting Ellen's transformation from an immature bride to someone acting more grown up and love. Upon Mona's teasing insinuations about falling in love, Ellen, surprised, denies any romantic involvement with Aiden, emphasizing their friendship. In her thoughts, Ellen acknowledges that Aiden is destined for a different heroine in the novel and asserts her mission to help Aiden before eventually leaving. Mona then informs her about the imminent return of Duke and Duchess Lyanster to the estate, expected the day after tomorrow. The next morning, everyone gathers to welcome Duke Logan Lyanster and Duchess Isabella Lyanster, who arrive in a carriage. Aiden warmly greets his parents, expressing joy at their return. Ellen is in awe of the aristocratic couple, noting their every action exudes class and wealth. When introducing herself as Ellen Lyonster, she's honored to meet them. Duke Logan and Duchess Isabella respond with polite greetings, leaving Ellen impressed with their calculated and refined demeanor, realizing the essence of being top aristocrats. Isabella dismisses Ellen and Aiden, suggesting proper greetings in the morning. Duke Logan and Isabella enter the estate. Ellen, now Lady Lyanster, wonders if she can handle her new role. The servants present proposals to Duke Logan, and a maid provides a list of expenditures and receipts to Duchess Isabella. Whitney then reports to the Duchess, highlighting Aiden's progress in morning training and studies, emphasizing his capability to manage the family's businesses independently. Whitney reports that Aiden, encouraged by Lady Ellen, has been misbehaving and leaving the estate without permission, negatively impacting his lessons. Lady Ellen's lack of proficiency in managing the household is evident as she directs the servants without clear guidance, leading to confusion and constant requests for assistance. While her outspoken nature may be attributed to her young age, Winnie observes how she restrains Lord Aiden from expressing himself and wields significant control over him. Winnie expresses concern that Aiden's behavior, influenced by Lady Ellen, might portray the Lyansters as weak to the Jahards and other noble families. Duchess Isabella contemplates this and then states that she understands— when Whitney suggests discussing this with Lady Ellen, Isabella abruptly rejects the idea, asserting that although Lady Ellen is young, she should not be treated as a child now that she is Aiden's wife. Isabella instructs Whitney to cease looking after Aiden for the time being. This decision surprises Whitney and Duke Logan concurs with Isabella's perspective. Whitney contemplates the situation, questioning if Aiden's parents are trying to ignore the issues due to indifference towards their son. She expresses a sense of frustration, feeling that they don't care about Aiden. Despite this, she agrees to Isabella's decision. 
Isabel acknowledges that their daughter-in-law, Ellen, has a strong personality. The conversation reaches Ellen through Nanny Whitney's report. Mona warns Ellen to behave well at breakfast, likely due to the concerns raised by Whitney. Ellen enthusiastically greets Aiden in the morning, relieved to see him well after the previous day's events. The entire Lionster family gathers for breakfast. Aiden expresses the realization that it's their first breakfast together. Isabella encourages them to enjoy the meal and Ellen, feeling a bit overwhelmed, tries to divert attention by praising the salad. The atmosphere appears to be intense for Ellen. The next morning, Isabella expresses the desire to have a chat with Ellen, who thanks her for the invitation and looks forward to her return. Isabella inquires about Ellen's stay, acknowledging the challenge of being surrounded by unfamiliar servants. Despite the concern, Ellen assures Isabella that the servants have been helpful and welcoming. Isabella then suggests trying the tea, creating an opportunity for a relaxed conversation between them. Isabella informs Ellen that the tea is made from leaves found exclusively in their territory. As Ellen sips the tea, she wonders if its bitterness is due to her being physically a child. Isabella asks Ellen about the taste, and Ellen admits her limited knowledge about tea, being more accustomed to sweet tea. Isabella acknowledges this and suggests trying a different tea with a fruity fragrance, to which Ellen finds much more appealing. Isabella reassures Ellen not to change, leaving Ellen surprised by the unexpected comment. However, Isabella advises Ellen not to force herself to consume things she dislikes and only enjoy what she prefers. Ellen acknowledges this and Isabella brings up Ellen's relationship with her son, expressing her approval and wishing them the best. Ellen, however, is uncertain about Isabella's true thoughts and wonders if Nanny Whitney shared any insights. Isabella adds another piece of advice, telling Ellen that as a Lionster, she should practice holding more authority. Ellen is left perplexed, questioning the meaning behind Isabella's words. At night, Aiden and Ellen lie together on a bed. Aiden inquires about Ellen's tea with his mother, and she responds positively, inviting him to join next time. Aiden reveals he doesn't usually have personal time with his parents and doesn't drink tea with them. Ellen encourages him to start, assuring him she'll be there to make him feel comfortable. Aiden then asks if Ellen genuinely desired the responsibility of redistributing work among the servants. Ellen questions Aiden if he's worrying about her to which he hesitates in response. She reassures him, expressing her capability and willingness to take on responsibilities. Aiden, pondering her words, feels somewhat treated like a child. Suddenly, Ellen playfully falls onto Aiden, and he encourages her, expressing belief in her abilities. Ellen, touched by Aiden's kindness, finds him incredibly lovable and expresses gratitude. When he approaches Ellen and questions her about being in charge of re-examining the staff's duties for the quarter, Ellen confirms the task assigned by her grace and a maid asks if she has written down the tasks she wants. Whitney acknowledges this and wishes Ellen well on her first official task before leaving. Ellen, pondering the situation, feels an odd sense of familiarity, similar to the feeling she had with Aiden's mother. On the other hand, Whitney announces that Lady Ellen is in charge of distributing the work for the quarter and as a result all servants will be assigned more challenging duties. The servants express concern and Whitney explains that she lacks the power to prevent their demotion. Encouraging them, Winnie advises the servants to be angry and to demonstrate to Lady Ellen how things are typically handled. She suggests that the collective voice of the adult servants could outweigh the stubbornness of one young girl. In the midst of this, Ellen addresses the servants and maids, informing them that she has reviewed everyone's work and reassigned tasks based on experience and aptitude. The maids express dissatisfaction, claiming it's unacceptable. Ellen asserts that if they dislike their tasks now, she will reconsider their work next quarter based on their efforts. The maids protest, questioning the need for switching duties when their work has been adequate. Accusations arise, suggesting Ellen might be punishing them due to Nanny Whitney, and they question why she is disregarding their previous efforts. Addressing the two maids, Ellen directs them to the lab, where she points out their shortcomings. She notes that they worked in the house apothecary and were in charge of Aiden's dressing room. Ellen criticizes them for failing to read labels and logging herbs incorrectly multiple times in the past three months. Furthermore, she highlights the disposal of herbs due to their neglect, allowing them to deteriorate for an entire month. Ellen, continuing her assessment, addresses a servant and points out specific issues with the jackets. She highlights the collection of nine loose buttons from examining the jackets, making it ten in total. Drawing attention to a specific jacket, she notes the folded-in side pleat on the sleeve, questioning the claim of perfectly adequate work. The servant responds, admitting occasional slips but justifying them as trivial mistakes that can happen frequently. Ellen, emphasizing the importance of every job in the household, responds to his servant's question about the perceived equality of tasks. The servant expresses discontent, particularly regarding weeding and shoveling manure, deeming them the most dreaded tasks. Ellen, reflecting on the revelation, recalls Aiden's words about Nanny Whitney's potential reaction. 
Despite uncertainty about Manny Whitney's plan, Ellen remains determined to complete her assigned tasks. In the present time, made comments on Ellen's youthful attention to detail, suggesting that her critical approach is natural for someone of her age. Ellen contemplates Nanny Whitney's potential tactics, anticipating that she might try to provoke Ellen into making a scene. A maid advises Ellen to be more flexible, but Ellen is wary of falling into traps set by Nanny Whitney and her followers. Just then, Duchess Isabella enters, questioning the situation. The servants and maids fall silent. Ellen fears that Nanny Whitney will involve Isabella and attempt to portray Ellen as unfit for her duties. Whitney addresses Duchess Isabella, admitting her intervention due to dissatisfaction among the servants regarding their new duties assigned by Lady Ellen. She suggests that Ellen's enthusiasm may have led to oversight in some task assignments. Isabella questions Ellen about this, and Ellen responds by explaining that after conversing with the staff, she identified issues with the previous work distribution. Ellen discovered that experienced and proficient servants were undertaking tasks beneath their skill levels, prompting her to reassign duties accordingly. Ellen continues her explanation, stating that tasks were inefficiently carried out because those with less experience were assigned duties beyond their capacity. Furthermore, she reveals that some tasks were being used as a form of punishment, with Manny Whitney being the orchestrator. Isabella looks towards Whitney, who dismisses Ellen's approach, claiming it as ignorance. Whitney argues that Ellen is using trivial mistakes as an excuse to redistribute work arbitrarily. Duchess Isabella intervenes, questioning the fairness of Ellen's actions and expressing skepticism about the situation. Isabella asserts that Ellen is utilizing her authority as a Lionster, emphasizing that despite her youth and inexperience, belittling a superior is not acceptable. Whitney tries to explain her perspective, suggesting that Ellen might have valid reasons for her task assignments. However, Isabella supports Nanny Whitney, leading Ellen to express her concern about how menial tasks are considered punishments, causing ridicule for the servants assigned to them. Ellen questions the motivation for these servants to work diligently when faced with such conditions. Ellen suggests that tasks considered undesirable should be rewarded to motivate the servants. Drawing an analogy to her own experience of receiving chocolate-covered strawberries after taking bitter medicine, she proposes a system where completion of less desirable tasks is followed by rewards. However, Isabella questions the feasibility of rewarding the staff with chocolate-covered strawberries and asks Ellen for alternative suggestions. Ellen suggests using monetary rewards as an incentive for completing undesirable tasks, prompting Whitney to express skepticism about the effectiveness of such rewards. Despite Whitney's reservations, the maids and servants enthusiastically volunteer to undertake challenging duties, citing their family responsibilities as motivation. Another maid seeks permission to share her thoughts and Isabella grants her permission. The maid expresses the staff's desire to remain under Lady Ellen's direction, highlighting Ellen's attentive and considerate approach. The servants emphasize Ellen's willingness to listen and allocate tasks tailored to their abilities, even during the recent assignments. Isabella acknowledges their sentiments and agrees to distribute work according to Ellen's suggestions, including wage adjustments and improvements to working conditions. Ellen expresses her need for Isabella's assistance in determining adequate work conditions, acknowledging her lack of skill in this area. On the other hand, Whitney voices concern, urging Isabella to reconsider, fearing that addressing complaints and providing higher wages might lead to chaos among the staff. Whitney anticipates negative perceptions from high society, suggesting that it could be seen as House Lionster compromising its dignity for the preferences of a young member. Isabella recounts a past incident where Aiden fell seriously ill during his childhood, highlighting the immense care and dedication Whitney showed in nursing him back to health. Isabella questions the idea of setting everything aside for one child, emphasizing the scrutiny from the Council of Elders regarding Aiden's ability to inherit the family legacy. She expresses concern that Aiden does not need a mother who cannot control her emotions. Isabella even hints at regret, suggesting that they should have prevented Whitney from raising him. Isabella sternly addresses Whitney, expressing her concern about her emotional state and its impact on the reputation of House Lionster. Isabella questions Whitney's fitness as the Lady of the House, emphasizing the need for maintaining dignity as the future Duchess. She reminds Whitney of the additional authority given over the staff cannot due to a lack of alternatives but as a preparation for her role as the next Duchess. Isabella urges Whitney to compose herself, highlighting the potential consequences of others in high society forming negative opinions if she does not uphold the expected standards. Isabella expresses her disappointment in Whitney's failure to extend the same caring attitude she showed towards Aiden to the rest of the staff. She clarifies that her expectation was not for Whitney to be concerned about the family's honor, but rather to care for the servants on her behalf. Whitney attempts to justify herself, mentioning Lady Ellen's control over Aiden and how she listens to the staff. Isabella, in response, instructs Helena to investigate Nanny Whitney, her work at the estate, and any details about her past.
suggesting a deeper exploration into Whitney's background and actions. Ellen discusses her suspicion with Mona that Isabella may be investigating Nanny Whitney. Although Helena didn't explicitly mention it, Mona believes there must be a significant reason for Helena's inquiries about Whitney. Ellen contemplates Isabella's motivations, considering the possibility that Isabella cares more about her son, Aiden, than Ellen initially believed. Ellen reflects on her hesitation to reveal Whitney's true nature to Isabella, fearing that if Isabella was indeed indifferent towards Aiden, it could have caused more harm to him. Ellen expresses her concern that even if Isabella loves Aiden in her own way, her lack of awareness of Aiden's suffering indicates she is not actively involved in his life. Seeing Aiden's prolonged misery, Ellen feels a need for everyone to be aware of the situation. Mona suggests heading to the dining hall, and as they move in that direction, Ellen contemplates the necessity for the adults to reflect on the times they fail to take responsibility in Aiden's life. Observing the Duke and Duchess during breakfast, Ellen discerns that their relationship requires attention, as they barely exchange glances. Aiden, sensing the tension, asks to be excused, heading off to train. Ellen wishes him luck and Isabella, addressing Aiden, seems to hesitate in her words, only wishing him a pleasant day without revealing much. Ellen notes Aiden's dedication to training, mentioning that he often takes a walk around the grounds to review his mistakes and make improvements. As Isabella watches Aiden, Ellen observes from a distance with binoculars, anticipating Isabella's arrival. She acknowledges Isabella's genuine care for Aiden, but remarks that Isabella struggles to express it. Ellen senses the awkwardness between them, predicting that they might find it challenging to exchange words if the current situation persists. Ellen rushes towards Aiden and Isabella, but accidentally collides with Duke Logan. After exchanging greetings, Duke Logan sits in a chair, appearing melancholic. Observing his demeanor, Ellen wonders about his state of mind. Trying to ease the situation, she offers him binoculars and he accepts with gratitude. As Duke Logan looks through the binoculars, Ellen stands back, contemplating the challenging dynamics within Aiden's family. Frustrated with the apparent issues between Aiden's parents, she decides to prioritize helping Isabella first, driven by her concern for the strained relationships in the Lionster household. Isabella and Aiden stand facing each other, both feeling unsure about what to say. Aiden reflects on the awkwardness of the situation, especially under Isabella's gaze. At that moment, Ellen rushes in, addressing both Isabella and Aiden enthusiastically. Expressing relief at catching them together, Ellen suggests they all take a walk. She inwardly acknowledges the importance of intervening and facilitating a more comfortable atmosphere between Aiden and his mother. Ellen appreciates the charm of them walking together. Isabella contemplates removing a petal from Aiden's hair, aiming to do so discreetly. However, Aiden becomes apprehensive, prompting Isabella to apologize for startling him. Meanwhile, Ellen, noticing a full petal, takes it and places it in Aiden's hair, expressing confidence that it suits him. Aiden, in return, suggests finding a matching petal for Ellen. Ellen, addressing Isabella as your grace, offers to give her a petal as well, admiring the resemblance between Isabella and Aiden. Isabella graciously thanks her for the gesture. Isabella returns to her room, carefully placing the peels in her box. Helena enters, expressing readiness to present her report on Nanny Whitney. Helena reveals that Nanny Whitney interferes in Lord Aiden's clothing choices, behavior, and relationships during his training sessions and lessons. Prior to Lady Ellen intervening, Nanny Whitney would lecture Lord Aiden for extended periods minus 10 to 12 hours at a time. Helena continues her report, highlighting specific testimonies that portray a concerning dynamic between Nanny Whitney and Lord Aiden during the private lectures. Testimonies reveal Lord Aiden's perceived helplessness to Nanny Whitney's commands, his apparent fear of her in instances where Nanny Whitney would physically grip him with such force after lesson that it left visible marks on his arm or shoulder. Isabella, enraged by the revelations, summons Whitney to address the accusations. Whitney, in a desperate plea, insists on her innocence, blaming Lady Ellen for orchestrating the situation. Isabella sternly dismisses Whitney, accusing her of exploiting Lord Aiden to satisfy her own superiority complex. Isabella orders Whitney's removal from the estate, forbidding her to return. Whitney, still pleading, emphasizes her dedication to Lord Aiden's education. Isabella, visibly angered by the revelations about Whitney's mistreatment of Lord Aiden, seizes Whitney's dress and admonishes her for instilling fear in her child rather than providing genuine education. She accuses Whitney of abuse and issues a severe warning, refraining from executing her. Meanwhile, Aiden observes the scene from above, struggling to reconcile the image of Whitney as a menacing figure with the reality of her vulnerability and insignificance. Whitney, desperate and pleading for mercy, faces Isabella's wrath as Aiden reflects on how Ellen helped him overcome his fear. Guards move to take Whitney away, but she vehemently resists, hurling insults at Isabella. Duke Glovin intervenes, bringing Whitney under control and also restraining a maid and a servant. 
Isabella, acknowledging Duke Logan's awareness of the situation, stands firm in her decision, having received the report on Manny Whitney's actions. Isabella, with a mixture of regret and frustration, confronts Duke Logan about their failure to understand Lord Aiden's suffering. She questions the perception of Aiden's dignity and the stoic facade he maintained, expressing how they overlooked his hidden fears. Isabella blames herself for contributing to Aiden's isolation, realizing that they urged him to conform to the Lionster name without understanding his struggles. She challenges Duke Logan's seemingly unaffected demeanor, highlighting the privileged perspective of staying put and maintaining composure, contrasting it with the turmoil within their family. In reflection, Duke Logan expresses regret for viewing Isabella merely as a means to fulfill family expectations, acknowledging the influence of societal norms on their marriage. He limits the rigid rules dictating their private lives and the potential consequences of deviating from them. The Duke questions traditional gender roles and the expectations placed on a duchess, emphasizing the strict adherence demanded by noble society. As he contemplates the limitations imposed on their relationship, Logan admits his desire to be a source of strength for Isabella. Isabella, however, raises doubts about whether his mother truly understands what is best for Aiden. The Duke shares his feelings of helplessness, living each day as if his flame were about to flicker away into darkness. Duke Logan's father sternly reminds him of the consequences of being an illegitimate child, emphasizing that without the hair position, he would be relegated to the lowest echelons of society. The father asserts his influence over the family and ministers, making it clear that Duke Logan's survival in their world depends on not disappointing him. Duke Logan, expressing the pressure he faced, acknowledges that he had to cling to his role as the hair, his one lifeline. He apologizes to Isabella and asks her to comply with his mother's wishes for a little while longer. In recounting his past, Logan passionately declares his vow to be strong enough to claim the Lanster name, defy his mother's reign of terror, and protect his wife and son. He reflects on the sacrifices he made, acknowledging that he lost something important while trying to hold on, but convinced himself it was worth it for the safety of his family. He believes that no one could touch his family now, and being strong enough to protect Isabella and their son is all that truly matters to him. In the present, Isabella expresses her acceptance of Logan always ignoring her, stating that she's used to it. However, she emphasizes that he should have been there for Aiden, their sweet young son, highlighting the emotional toll of parental absence on their child. Upon Duke Logan lowering his head, Isabella comments that change still seems impossible for him. Unbeknownst to them, the maid overhears the conversation. The maid later shares with Ellen that Isabella found it impossible to connect with Duke Logan. Ellen expresses surprise, asking if Isabella really said that. The maid explains that it was uncomfortable to witness, but she couldn't help but feel sympathy for the couple. Ellen reflects on Duke Lionster's stoic and aloof demeanor, noting his apparent disinterest and avoidance of eye contact. However, she speculates that his challenges in connecting with others might be the reason behind his distant behavior. Ellen reflects on the possibility of reconciliation between Isabella and Duke Logan, pondering whether Isabella's emotional closure means there's no hope for their relationship. She wishes the family could learn to open up, believing it would significantly improve Aiden's life compared to the original novel. The notion of not recognizing anyone's worth before meeting a special someone weighs heavily on her. The next morning, Isabella, filled with remorse, apologizes to Aiden for not realizing his suffering sooner and acknowledges her inadequacies as a mother, expressing deep regret and seeking forgiveness. Isabella, expressing her commitment to change, tells Aiden that he should come to her whenever he needs anything, promising to help and protect him. Aiden questions if following the traditional Lionster way, handling problems independently, is the right approach. Isabella reassures him, emphasizing that there's no rigid Lionster way and encourages him to think about what he wants, creating a new path for the family. Aiden, contemplating his desires, eventually takes his mother's hand and Isabella, concerned for his well-being, advises him not to push himself for her sake. Aiden then leaves the room. Isabella, contemplating Ellen's knowledge of the truth, acknowledges that Ellen intentionally kept it from her, realizing the significance of her personal discovery. Expressing relief, she appreciates that Ellen is now married to her son. Meanwhile, Aiden, departing, finds an unusual sense of peace, expecting suppressed emotions to surface. However, recalling the decision to remove Whitney, he concludes that those concerns are now insignificant as he has found something more meaningful in his life. Aiden reflects on the significant impact Ellen has had on his life, recalling how she appeared suddenly, claiming to be on his side. He acknowledges her unwavering support in solving his problems. Aiden realizes that Ellen has become an integral part of his life, feeling as though every chain around him is coming undone. He expresses a deep desire to keep Ellen by his side forever, vowing to do whatever it takes and not let anyone take her away from him. Ellen, surprised, questions Aiden about holding his mother's hand. Aiden confirms it and Ellen acknowledges that it must have made Isabella happy, recognizing the courage it took. 
She advises Aiden not to force himself if it becomes too overwhelming. Ellen emphasizes her intention to help him feel braver around others without pushing him into discomfort. Aiden shares that it wasn't that bad, revealing that he anticipated Ellen's positive response, which motivates him to improve. Ellen, reflecting on Aiden's progress, notes that he is certainly doing much better than before. Aiden is practicing in the training grounds when Ellen cheers him on, expressing admiration for how dashing he looks with a sword. She wishes she could learn to use one. Isabella suggests that Ellen take sword lessons, sharing that she had basic sword training before marriage. Surprised, Ellen enthusiastically asks if Isabella will teach her. Isabella, mentioning it has been a while since she last held a sword, suggests she needs to practice first to jog her memory. Afterwards, she proposes that they train together to help each other learn. Ellen wonders how a woman like Isabella manages to live so quietly in the family. She then asks Isabella about Duke Logan's reputation as the best swordsman in the Empire, considering him a war hero. Excitedly, she suggests that they ask him to teach them. Ellen envisions the whole family, including Aiden, training together. Surprised by this idea, Isabella is taken aback by the unexpected proposal. Isabella reflects on Duke Logan, acknowledging his elegance and nimbleness, making him irresistible. She describes how a glimpse into his melancholy eyes could occupy her thoughts for days. Then, expressing doubt, Isabella tells Ellen that she doesn't believe her husband would want to spend time with her. Ellen, noticing Isabella's emotions, asks about her feelings, to which Isabella insists that it doesn't matter how she feels. However, Ellen perceives the clear expression on Isabella's face, suggesting that she misses Duke Logan very much. Ellen approaches Duke Logan, recounting an encounter with Isabella and expressing her desire to build a positive relationship with Aiden and the Duke. She envisions enjoyable activities together, like drinking tea and going on holidays. Duke Logan, however, dismisses the idea, claiming to be too busy. Ellen playfully accuses him of having time to spy and even returning opera glasses, suggesting his feelings for Isabella. She questions why he isn't taking any action if he cares for her so much. Ellen passionately advises Duke Logan on the importance of spending time with the person he loves, emphasizing that it strengthens the bond and nurtures love. She encourages him to express his feelings to Isabella, insisting that Isabella may be waiting for him to do so. Duke Logan, however, denies any belief in Isabella having feelings for him. Ellen counters, sharing observations of Isabella looking lonely when Duke is mentioned, not angry or disgusted but guarded. She implores Duke not to let Isabella feel lonely, emphasizing that no one understands him better than his own wife. Ellen, expressing her fondness for Duke Logan, assigns him a task to visit the training grounds where Isabella will be that night and express his feelings to her. She believes it will be easier for Isabella to listen to him in a calm and quiet place. However, as Ellen goes to the training grounds herself, she begins to doubt Duke's commitment to the task, wondering where he could be. Meanwhile, Helena notices Isabella seeming tired and questions if she's doing too much, to which Isabella replies that she is only loosening up her body. Ellen contemplates the idea of Aiden joining the family in sword training, envisioning a scenario where the entire family can bond and train together. Simultaneously, Isabella also entertains the thought, finding it worthwhile to spend more time with Aiden and Ellen. However, the moment is interrupted when Duke Logan appears behind Isabella, urging her to wear better protection during training to avoid getting hurt. Isabella is surprised by this unexpected concern, and her mind briefly shifts to the past. The scene then transitions to a request for Duke Logan to wear a necklace gifted by Count Piero, with Logan needing assistance in clasping it. Isabella reflects on how Logan always manages to surprise her when she least expects it. In the present, Isabella cautiously considers Duke Logan's recent gentlemanly behavior, warning herself not to raise her hopes too high. Meanwhile, Duke Logan, in an attempt to mend their relationship, suggests a sparring match, noting that Isabella used to retreat to the training grounds during challenging times. Isabella, seeking a connection, proposes that he teach her what he has been practicing in solitude. Unbeknownst to them, Ellen, observing from a distance, is disappointed that her plan for them to reconcile seems to have turned into a potential confrontation. Duke Logan, expressing vulnerability, gives Isabella the choice to leave or ignore him emphasizing that he will only defend and asks her to do as she pleases. Then Isabella launches an attack on Duke Logan with her sword, and he skillfully defends himself. Due to the force in Isabella's hand, she experiences pain, prompting Duke Logan to express concern, asking if she is all right. Isabella, however, insists on being released and shares her thoughts about considering divorce in the past, contemplating it as a way for Aiden to grow up without the isolation and loneliness imposed by their marriage. Despite these considerations, she assures Duke that she won't burden Aiden with divorced parents. In a surprising turn, Isabella launches another attack on Duke Logan, who manages to protect himself once again. 
Isabella vehemently declares that she won't allow her child to be controlled by the Lionster name any longer, asserting that she doesn't need Duke Logan or his supposedly useless yet powerful sword to protect her child. In a fit of anger, Duke Logan grabs Isabella's hand. Witnessing this, Ellen is shocked and concerned, thinking about Logan's actions. Subsequently, both Isabella and Duke Logan end up on the floor. Ellen, still pondering the situation, reflects on the importance of expressing feelings, emphasizing that Isabella won't truly understand Duke Logan's emotions unless he communicates them to her, given the depth of their relationship. Duke Logan reveals that he stayed away to spare Isabella from further misery, believing it was the right choice, as she already endures a lot as his wife. Isabella is astonished and questions this revelation, expressing confusion about Duke Logan's feelings. Duke Logan, with a tender expression, confesses that he has always loved her. Isabella, taken aback by this unexpected declaration from her husband, is visibly moved and asks him to clarify what he just said. Duke Logan reaffirms his love, stating that the moments they've shared are his favorite memories. Isabella, overwhelmed, urges him to wait, wanting to process the surprising turn of events.